Hello there folks, I'm Dan Brown from a sort of interesting life.com. You're joining me on board good old narrowboat Tilly and today we are going to talk about some super simple everyday boat life tips that I have learnt as time goes on. Now these are all going to be pretty basic ones as I wanted to make this into more of a series of videos over the next few months rather than try and do one super documentary episode where I try and list every single tip I've ever picked up and every experience of a random nature from day-to-day -day life that I've had on board Tilly over the past three years and then I realised that that was going to be a very 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 long video and a very boring one too which is probably what some people will think about this one. So we'll dive straight in and like I say this is the most sort of basic and obvious things and maybe a few things that you won't think about until you're actually on a boat and experiencing it but at the very least there are a few things that I think might be interesting or of use to anybody coming on a boating holiday or a future potential boat owner liverboard whatever whatever your relation and interest in boats in this video is I hope you'll find something of slight interest if not use <laughs> so the first and most basic thing, and don't worry, I've got a clip of devastation on board after somebody had bumped Tilly and all sorts of stuff had fallen over. It's not really devastation to illustrate this point, but basically it is consider long and hard what sort of items you leave on the work surfaces on board particularly if you're going away for a few hours or going to work or going away for a weekend whatever you're doing just think long and hard of if you're away in particular what sort of stuff might fall on the floor and need your attention so obviously you've got things like don't leave candles and I'd say these days I don't really have candles because again I don't really like the idea of having something like that with even just the slight potential of falling over and maybe if you accidentally fall asleep and then for any unknown reason a boat hits you or something and it topples over it's not going to end well I don't think so I don't know candles are something that I'm getting further and further away from and don't really advise uh, having on board but what my actual real tip is the simple basic things that you might not even think about so for example I came home from work one day found that my washing up liquid had fallen off the sink hit the floor the cap had come off the washing up liquid bottle and all of the liquid was all over the floor now luckily in the kitchen I've got this sort of vinyl fake wooden floor effect that you can see just on the back wall there as well so it was a lot easier to clear up similarly the day that I came back after a boat had bumped into Tilly and what I discovered to my horror was that the moisture collectors and things like that had all tipped over off the little ledge that I normally have them on and all the water had spilled out and that was a lot of water probably almost two litres of water certainly a decent amount um, and so that had all then gone into things like my cloths and uh, my kitchen roll and stuff like that which didn't do it any good at all and ruined all of its absorbent qualities <laughs> back on track again I'm going to drift off into some terrible comedy routine throughout this video again I apologise that this isn't a super well edited documentary or anything like that or full of amazing boat scenery but people have been asking me to do a few more of these um, general talking about actual boating experiences and things that I've discovered with my time afloat so I thought Let's start at the absolute beginning and like I say, try and make this into more of a series of videos that maybe as time goes on, after I've done the basics in this video, I can theme them and talk about different things. So then, next topic, let's move on to nicer things. The summer and the sun. Now, it's typical that the day that I decide to talk about summer on a boat and how hot it can get is the 5th of August and it is currently absolutely pouring down out there. Again, I apologise if at any point you can hear any background noise or any sort of slight shh of rain if it starts to get heavier on the roof. But... The summer can fetch absolutely incredible weather. As anybody who's watched these videos or like the Facebook page or add me there or on Twitter and all that sort of stuff, when I post some of these pictures that I take of these beautiful summer's days on the canal, it's, I mean, even I, seeing it with my own eyes, sometimes struggle to believe that this is a real place that's actually going on and you can walk through and boat down and so on because it's just perfect. In the middle of summer, beautiful weather, you can't ask for much more, I think, than being out on a lovely canal and just enjoying whatever's around you, which out here is, luckily, an awful lot of lovely scenery in general. Now, what I want to talk about, though, is 
just how hot the sun in the middle of summer can be beaming down and making your boat. Now, on Tilly, I think this is probably a particularly bad problem because she's a small boat, but with six really big windows for the basic size of the boat. No portholes, all these proper big glass windows. So that means a lot of sunlight comes in and it gets very warm, but also the effect of the sun just beaming for literally like maybe 12 hours in a day onto the side of a thin painted metal hull of a boat is unbelievable and I learned my first lesson about just how hot the metal exterior of the boat can get when I walked down the step of the gunwale along the edge of the boat in bare feet and I can honestly say I was back inside and wearing slippers very very sharpish. Now that might be just something to think, oh, flipping heck, yeah, it might be pretty warm. Better make sure before I go and just sit down on the edge of the boat or something like that, or start putting my hands over it, or if I want to leave, I don't know, say if you're planning a bit of painting or if you're going to go out and clean the windows or something like that, you may want to consider what you leave on the extremely hot, or potentially extremely hot surfaces of the boat. And again, that's something I've learned definitely the hard way by leaving things inside on the uh, draining board and found that any sort of meltable item will definitely be very melted if the sun's coming in and onto it anyway, but just the metal of the draining board getting extremely warm too. Now, on top of this, what I really want to talk about that you may not sort of add in to the equation, and I certainly didn't, is the heat radiating through the side of the boat, and maybe it won't be so bad on modern boats, and Tilly's a good old 1987 boat, just like me, 28 years old. Oh, lovely God, how did we grow up so quick and get so old? Um, but in all seriousness, the, I can literally sometimes feel the heat by touching the wall, just radiating through in the summer. And that obviously adds to the overall temperature. Again, particularly if you're going out to work, if you're going to be going out for the day or a weekend and that, you might want to think, oh, are we going to leave something here, there, or put it somewhere, somewhere that's in the shade at the very least. But... The thing that I didn't expect was things like the paintings on the wall. And this isn't even an exterior wall. This is an interior wall on the bathroom next to the camera here. I've got my little paintings that I did many, many years ago. And there's two of those that are held up, or at least one of them that are held up by blue tack. And again, there's a few different bits and pieces. I mean, some things like uh, these lights and that that I've got around the place are held with blue tack. And it gets so hot just from the sunlight and the heat coming in from the outside of the boat over the summer. Very often it will heat the boat up so much that it melts the blue tack and you'll see stuff start to fall and drop. And it absolutely will frighten the life out of you. Well, it certainly frightens the life out of me, I can say that much. And even to this day there's certain things that, because I don't like to screw things on or glue things to the walls and that, there's still things like these paintings that are just there, blue tack, so I can pop them off and nobody will ever know there's anything there. Apart from it'll probably leave a weird faded shadow. Um, but, like I say, in actual real day-to-day -day life, randomly having things drop off the wall is not always a, a... I don't know what the word is. It's not always a pleasant experience. And certainly not something if you're sat at the desk or sat at your little table eating something and then suddenly something drops off the wall into your plate of food. That's not a good uh, thing to have happen. Again, these are completely basic, completely random, unrelated tips, but these are all random things that I've learnt along this bizarre boaty uh, lifestyle I've had for the last three years. Right then, I've had a quick drink and I can talk about boats for hours, but don't worry, I've seen how long this video's already getting, and as it's just a talking video, I'm going to try and cut it a little bit shorter. So I've got three things that I want to say now. Right, the first is, ironically, after talking about how hot the sun can make the boat in the sun, I'd also like to talk about how hot the sun can make the boat in the winter, or at least Tilly, which is a small boat and has these huge windows, like I was saying, which you can imagine over the winter, if you have the fire running and get it really nice and warm in here, the windows don't do much to help keep that heat in as it's just thin glass that lets all of the heat radiate straight out into the freezing world outside and that's a very downside thing to these uh, big windows on Tilly especially single glazed as they are 
But what I really want to talk about here is something that I discovered by having a winter mooring permit. So I stayed, um, stay over the winter months in one area in particular where the boat doesn't get much direct sunlight on it and doesn't really heat up. Oh, no, doesn't. Sorry, I completely messed that up. It doesn't really get any proper sun specifically from the side just for hours and hours throughout the day. And what I was amazed at when I went uh, around the corner and moored up Literally, same sort of place, only like a little distance away. And just by moving around the corner, getting out of the shelter of the trees and that, there would be sunlight directly coming from the side of the boat for a good few hours during the day. And it literally, sometimes, even though it was chilly outside, managed to warm the boat up. Again, this is probably based on the poor insulation that she's got to begin with. But I was amazed that it actually warmed it up enough that I didn't put much, if anything, into the fire to like act as a top up. And it wasn't until the evening, certainly in like the autumn days before it got really, really cold, that I would ever think, I really better get some uh, wood in this fire and get this blazing to heat this place up. Again, I apologise if the rain noise is now cutting into this video, but that was something that I was fascinated to learn that I literally used less fuel by mooring up in a certain area where the sunlight could do some of the heating to a certain extent at least for me. So again, that was a totally random thing just back on the topic of the sun. I'm going to close the door here to try and cut out some of this rain and noise. I apologise again for these random cuts in the video. Right then, number two of the final three things I'd like to talk about is water. Now because on a boat you have a very limited supply of water compared to an endless tap that runs out of something in the ground, you can only have as much water as your boat can hold. So. Tilly's water tank is just behind where the chair is in that sort of wood effect area just there and that makes up the space underneath where you stand in the bow of Tilly. I think it's maybe uh, about, I don't know, 200 litres or so. I, I don't know off the top of my head, I'm afraid I've completely forgotten that statistic. But basically, it's only a set amount. So obviously, you can move back and go to get some water if you need and what have you. But depending on what sort of boating you're doing and what you want to be doing, if you want to just go away and hide in a nice quiet place for a week, you might wish to consider how you can save water. And one of the things I've discovered is the simple thing. And it's an amazing thing that I learned really from my nan and granddad. And a lot of people will already know this and do this. To stop wasting water when you're letting say for example the hot water warm up well I don't use the hot water from the boiler at all pretty much anymore it's like it's only really over the summer that I do that because over the winter I instead of having a normal sort of top on the fire I pretty much always have the kettle st sat on top of the fire so at any given moment I have got very hot water to say the least now that's something that you have to keep an eye on because obviously sooner or later the water will start boiling so you don't want to I don't know um, just randomly be distracted watching the telly or something and find that behind you by 10 foot there's a kettle being boiling and filling the place up with condensation for the last half an hour but again it's something that firstly it stops me having to have the boiler on all the time and using that up for hot water it's literally running off what's heating the boat itself so it's just a total well, that heat would be coming out of the fire anyway might as well make more of a use of it and the wood and whatever coal and that that you've got going in cost saving um but that was a bit of a david brent ricky gervais style moment then i'm sorry about that um but like i say instead of running the hot tap to let that water come out and waste whatever's coming in and or out or what have you but as i was saying what I learned from my nan and granddad was the unbelievable amount of water that you just pour straight into the sink or whatever, wherever it goes when you let the water run while you're waiting for it to heat up. Now they've got a water butt that they fill up entirely from water that they've collected in the kitchen, uh, just a little bowl in the kitchen sink from letting the hot water warm up and they fill it up in no time just from that alone it doesn't have a pipe coming down from the guttering or anything like that it's just all water that would otherwise would have gone straight down the plug hole and out into the sewers so that's something that fascinated me and it's something for a long time though that I've always had a kettle of water there like I say you've got to be careful that you don't let it boil and also you've got to be extremely careful you don't knock it off or anything like that equally 
definitely you've got to be extremely careful when pouring that water into the bowl because if you're pouring very very hot water off a fire there's a good chance you could end up putting your hands in it and getting scalded or seriously burnt again I don't advise that and I like to say this is just what I do um, so like I say I'm extremely careful because I, I have definitely burnt and I think I'm not sure which hand but one of these fingers I've burnt very much in, well not so much very much but let's say it had a weird texture for a few days afterwards say that much again i apologize for these really weird things i'm saying in this video uh, but again it's that sort of simple thing where i can heat up the water there i don't have to let the water warm up and waste the water coming out of there and also i don't end up having that water just disappearing and slowly depleting what's in the tank in the front and again it's like i say it's no huge deal because you can probably very often easily get to the next water point to fill up but if there's trees down in the canal or if it's closed or anything and during my first winter on a boat there were huge amounts of trees down and heavy snow and it would easily be the sort of situation that I could see myself getting a little bit uh, panicky as I'd wasted so much water in the run-up to those events. Then, say, if I was stuck for two weeks somewhere, trying to ration out what was left and make sure that I didn't just get a bit stupid and waste it all on some random, oh, yeah, I've got loads of washing up to do. It's not hot. It's not hot. It's not hot. Oh, it's hot. Right. Carry on. And you get what I'm you get what I'm driving at, basically. Water is something that you might want to look at different ways that you can save just in case you do find yourself in a position where you can't just nip down and fill up at any given moment. Again, though, that's just my experiences and just a few things that I've discovered. Finally, I would like to round things off with something completely unrelated to any of the previous things mentioned, just to make sure this is as many basic random tips as I could think of, although I have cut this video short, so expect more videos like this as time goes on, is tiller obstructions. Now, we're not talking about things getting wrapped around the rudder or the propeller or anything. We're talking about the unbelievably easy to do thing of going, right, going on a boat trip and then you go and move the tiller and find, oh, hang on, why on earth didn't I move that? Or, oh, no, I've just knocked something into the canal. And that is something, or basically getting the tiller obstructed by my bike seat is something that I can't imagine, I can't tell you how many times when I first got Tilly that that happened and me and my friends would be like set off, we'd push out and then suddenly I'd move the tiller and it'd be like, oh no, the bike seat's still up, the bike seat's still up. So one of us would have to run down into the boat and find an Allen key to drop the bike seat so then the tiller can move freely over the top. And that's something that one of the things that makes it so easy to uh, forget and miss is obviously the stern and anything that you may have, because obviously Tilly's got a very unusual big stern with a rail all the way around it. Um, depending on your setup and that, you might not ever have this problem, but always, always make sure before you set off that your tiller can move freely because, like I say, it's such a simple, easy mistake to make and I've seen people do it and I've seen um, the holiday boats do it where there's been stuff stood up or people trying to sit down on the stern and then suddenly they need to move the tiller or somebody else on the tiller needs to move it extreme in one direction and, of course, somebody sat there with their face at tiller height so it's like, whoa, something out of the Matrix and... Basically, definitely don't sit anywhere near where the tiller may need to move because if there's anything that hits the rudder, for example, under the water, it can snap the tiller out of your hand. And I've had that happen once, only once, I'm glad to say. And it was pretty scary like, just to be boating along, everything calm and peaceful as you imagine, and then suddenly have the tiller just go whoosh and like, whoa, hang on, what was that? Wakes you up, I'll say that much. Um, but like I was saying... There's all sorts of different things that for any particular reason, if you just lean a mop or a broom, if you've been sweeping up against it, it's like there's so many things. That it's so easy to uh, just completely forget and then go and move the tiller and knock something overboard or, like I say, find that the tiller can't move somewhere. So you're steering severely hampered and this is something that I find particularly easy to do with obviously having me bike on the stern all the time. But when friends come on board and fetch their bikes and we lock them all up on the back then i completely forget and don't think about it and we'll find that my bike will, or my 
Man, I can't say me wit. I'll find that the tiller will move across and hit one of their bike seats. And it's like, oh, no, quick, get the Allen key, get the Allen key. And again, totally simple, totally basic, but something that certainly in my early days on board, I very much uh, fell into the trap of. And again, like I say, this video hasn't been any super exciting in-depth analysis of the pros and cons and all that sort of stuff um, and I'll I'll get to more videos like that because people seem to be asking me more and more for him at the moment but for the time being I'll post some links in the description to my proper tutorials and documentary episodes like how to get through a lock on your own, simple Dan's now about life documentaries, all that sort of stuff, lift bridges general bits and pieces like that so i'll share those in the description below also while you're there you may well wish to consider checking out one of my boaty books for the kindle search amazon for the narrowboat lad or find links to those in the description as well and um, please do they're only short and if you like these videos then please consider checking those out as a way to support them and keep the camera rolling all that sort of jargon and stuff that people tend to say um, as well feel free to add me on Facebook Twitter or feel free to just follow me on Facebook like the Facebook page post loads of boating pictures and random updates from Life Afloat and until the next time just keep it incredibly boat worthy have a fantastic day and of course farewell <laughs>